Good morning, everyone. Um, Your Excellency, since Yemi said we're family, the first thing I'm going to do is um, cross boundaries and abuse power like families do. <laughs> and I was very surprised to hear that you're a very serious soccer fan, and the regional soccer league is named the Kagami Cup. Can you tell us a bit about that? It must be a presidential first. <laughs> well, right from, uh, you know, even as old as I am, We've all been kids growing up and uh, sport uh, like uh, soccer and uh, other kinds of sports being a really part of uh, our lives, no matter which kind of uh, life you have lived. So I grew up with soccer as a soccer player, young boy in school, and as I was growing up, the same thing. I used to play volleyball, I used to do all kinds of things. So I, and I grew up with this passion, so I, in, in <coughs> at this time, I can't play soccer now. <laughs> it's, it's, it's too late for me. I can't go back to the old days to play soccer. So. What I did, I just decided to transform my passion into this kind of support. Uh, I'm a fan of uh, soccer, then I support it so that young people can really enjoy it. And those who don't have uh, ways of accessing uh, different facilities, if we can be helpful in any way, I've always been happy to do that. That's great to hear. It's certainly my first time in Rwanda, so I think one of the most striking things I saw that I'm sure other people commented on was how clean and organized everything was. Absolutely no litter, neatly paved walkways, no graffiti at all. Even some of the best cities struggle to achieve this. And I think it's obviously striking, and it's not just about the cleanliness. Is there some kind of social engineering behind this? What is behind this, uh, again, dates back? When I was still a child, yes. I used to see my mother clean the house, the homestead, and later on as we were growing up, we would join her and do the same. So the question is, why would we be doing this? Yes. Well, the answer is immediate. I mean, who would enjoy uh, staying and living in a heap of litter and all kinds of stuff, it doesn't make sense. So, again, you can look at it at the personal level, at the homestead level, now even at the country level. Why shouldn't the country be clean? Why shouldn't the city be clean? With all the benefits that come with it, whether it is hygiene or many other things. and. I was convinced, it's, it's, and I used to discuss uh, with uh, my people here, I say, you know, there are many things we can't afford. Uh, there are many things uh, for which we need uh, uh, funding from donors and so on and so forth. Mm. But does cleaning your homestead it need uh, donors' money? So, uh, and I said, well, let's clean our homestead, which is our city, which is our country. Mm. This is something we can do very cheaply. It doesn't cost us much. And uh, let's enjoy the benefits of something that is so good and yet doesn't take uh, much in terms of uh, uh, expenses. Thank you for those insights. In your opening speech uh, yesterday at the opening of the forum, you talked about how there's, it's a myth that there's only one way to prosperity and success. Can you go a bit more into that, given us as Africans, we all have aspirations for a great Africa, um, and what's the role of Africans in determining their own for prosperity and success from Rwanda and as Africans? Yeah, in fact, it is that that lies uh, in the background of uh, that mm. kind of thinking or, or the discussion mm. you had. And as I learned, global leaders, young leaders here, global shapers, and mm. so on and so forth. So I'm, I imagine uh, many of you must be asking yourselves, uh, and oh, I would share with you this. If you are wanting to shape something, yes. 
you must be having some kind of thinking and say, I want to shape something this way for this reason. These are the benefits, and so on and so forth. And if you look at across Africa, we, we, we have a problem that we really need to, to address. I mean, let me start mm. from a, probably a different angle, more yeah. complex, that, but you still have to face it. Mm. I always ask myself, and I'm sure being young leaders or global shapers must be thinking about this, because if we don't, then I don't understand what we'll be doing. Africa, why are we so rich and yet so poor? Somebody has got to answer that question. Why do we have almost everything in terms of natural resources, in terms of people, young people like we have in the room and beyond, so many, who have been uh, you know, investing their time, their passion in learning, in getting skills and knowledge from across the world. I, I'm thinking this should be constituting or should be helping us to get that process going of answering that question. Why, why, and we are talking about Africa. I, I, we can talk about the whole world. Well, even for global shapers, please, you shape the world following shaping Africa. I think we, if we shaped Africa for ourselves the way we want it, and then uh, looking at elsewhere, learning lessons, and moving on, I think we would be doing fine. So there, is, there can't be one way of, of dealing with the problems because there are so many different kinds of problems from one place to another, from one context to another, and you want people of a place like our continent or any country where different young people come from. Uh, the, 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 there is something very common where more you know, alike in Africa than being different. But there are still these minor differences which are specific to each country, each context, and so on and so forth. So you have to bear this in mind so that you don't think that what worked elsewhere is necessarily going to work here because you might be actually addressing a different issues. So this is what I'm saying. There isn't one way. You can't, you can't have at a global scale, there is what they call the Western way, the Asian way, the, well, of course, I haven't heard much about the African way. <laughs> the Africa is caught in between. <laughs> Africa is sandwiched between uh, these other continents and, 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 you know, so we are expected to be shaping our own continent either in the manner these ones are doing it or the other ones are doing it. It's as if we don't own anything. And this is a big problem for me, and I'm sure it is a big problem for you that you need to address. Sure. As part of that self-determination journey for Rwanda, what have been the pillars that have underpinned your success as a country? What have you chosen um, as the values and pillars that supported your growth so far? One very important thing. You have got to have people with you. Because, after all, about them. And the moment you create an environment where this conversation goes on among people to understand the benefit of working together towards a common objective or goal they may have for their future, for their lives, that is key. So bringing people together to think about their problems and look for answers is key. And um, that happens at the same time, even as you recognize that among so many people, there are still going to be differences. So 
respect these differences in the society. At the same time, identify those things that actually are common to all of them and allow respect for the differences to take place. At the same time, the bigger goal of saying, okay, let's, while we may have these differences, let's use what is good in them to deal with this bigger problem that concerns all of us. For example, in Rwanda, it's about poverty, it's about stability of our country, it's about the future that really would lead us to prosperity that we want. So that is, that is common to all of us, irrespective of the age or where we are born or whatever the thinking is or whatever religion and so on and so forth. So let's use all these differences for us. So that, that's unity. And of course, you can't achieve much unless also have you create a situation where we are accountable. We are accountable to ourselves and to each other. That must definitely. And again, think beyond just these small things. I think we are better than that. We, 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 we must be looking beyond the immediate, the, whether there are benefits or what. You look at long term, what is it that is good for you and is good for others and is good for the country. So don't uh, uh, confine yourself to how far you go in thinking and how big the goal is. Now, what re remains is how you work towards achieving it. And maybe it will take longer in some cases than others, but you still have to have that big aim that you want to handle. Thank you. Um, one of the hot topics of conversation um, in Rwanda has really been what's, what's Rwanda after Kagame and what's your succession planning as far as leadership of Rwanda is and how are you empowering citizens to be able to follow through on that? You know, it's, it's been uh, something I've been dealing with among other things uh, for, for quite some time now. And uh, let me try and say it this way. When... Um, we were ahead in 2017, and 2017 I was supposed to be really winding up and uh, deciding what I do else with my life. Then a conversation starts, and uh, people coming up and saying, no, no, we, 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 you can't go. And uh, several times I had um, meetings with the people in my party, countrywide to discuss this issue because I wanted to push back on this and say, you know, we need to be thinking indeed beyond this, having a game even after 2017 and so on and so forth. And there would be even many more people than we have in this room, probably 10 times or more. These are young people, old, middle-aged, and my party and then other, others in the country. And I would tell them, I started with three things. I told them, there is no need to worry so much about change. We must think about change as something healthy, as and when it might, must happen, and maybe how it happens. I know also that you think about change, but if you're making good progress, you want to continue making good progress. That's fine. Change must not, you know, reverse the gains you've made over the years. You, you, take, you bear that in mind. And therefore, the third thing is stability is what allows that to happen. Change to happen, same time, progress to continue. And he said, think about it and let's have it play into this about the change that should or might happen come 2017. And of course, 
you will be surprised or you can ask anybody in this country, wherever you go, in the room, it's like I'm one against the rest. <laughs> it's like, okay, we, we understand that, that's so good, that's academic, and, uh, but, and, and they would even say, okay, but it all takes time. We don't think it is the time. Yes, we agree with you on all those principles, but we don't think it's time. He said, 2017, we are the ones who set this date anyway. But we think it's not the time. So we would go back and forth. It took a long time. And it wasn't changing uh, to any different situation. So anyway, so, but what, let me go back to, to, to the, the very question question about legacy and about, you know, how do we... I am hopeful that as we, for the last uh, 22 years, we've been here building a completely destroyed country and really the social fabric torn apart. Well, I, I'm hoping maybe, I would say maybe 22 years were not enough as they are saying but certainly in the 22 years we've been doing something. We've been building something. The institutions, the kind of thinking, the, you know, I, I'm sure Rwandans now realize they really live for much better things than probably they used to think were before that. So, I, 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 and I think this has been built, uh, building up to the point where things will be just fine as we continue to the years ahead. And uh, legacy is not about one thing. Legacy is not just about uh, what will happen in 2017. Legacy is about what has been building up over these many years. And this thinking of people and how they act and how they are ready to keep dealing with uh, their future generation to generation. So. Thank you for that. Um, I hope you're also getting your questions ready because we'll take some questions from the floor as well. Um, but before that, now that you've been um, president for quite some time, what are some of the things you wish you knew when you first took um, office? Uh, you know, first of all, coming to office, by the way, is something I never planned for. One thing kept le leading to another almost accidentally. But one sure thing, I have grown up all my life uh, understanding difficulty of life. I didn't know much about the difficulty of managing the society. Uh, so I, being in, in, in leadership as today and the leader of my country, I just, I, I was used to difficulties, hardships all along as I was growing up. Now I'm facing different difficulties. But I don't think there is any regret that uh, things should have happened this way or have, should have happened that way because I'm also realistic. There are things that may happen because of me, but there are many things, many more things that may happen in spite of me. <laughs> so I, I, everybody has that kind of, uh, uh, there are those limitations uh, and limits. Do you think anybody. any of your core beliefs or values have evolved over that time? Yes, I think uh, I, I, I've probably, I think I've got, uh, I've been wiser as I grow up. I've uh, come to understand uh, things better as I grow up, uh, but it's the same thing. We, we just keep moving and getting to understand better, getting more knowledge. Uh, uh, and uh, in my case, uh, getting really 
more hardened in my resolve to, to, to deal with issues uh, that I have to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Are there any questions coming up? We'll take about three questions. Please do remember to state your name um, and where you're coming from. I'll start with the gentleman at the back there and, no, and the lady there and that gentleman there. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Shion Daniel. I'm a global shaper from the Abuja Hub. And from my interactions with Rwandans, the majority of them, regardless of their sex, believe in the vision of a better Rwanda. Now, my question is this. How were you able to get the buy-in of everyone in your government, of those in the private sector, of grassroots Rwandans, in that vision of a better Rwanda? Thank you. Second question. Um, why don't I do the one at you want, you want to prefer one at a time? Okay. Yeah, no problem. The, the, the buying was uh, actually simple because they are buying into what they have created. Yes, it starts from the beginning. It's not that we, we, we write something and then later on go around asking people to have a buying. No, actually we write it with the people who have to buy. And this is, the, the, in fact, in the Vision 2020 we had or other things we have been doing, we have always made sure that we consult with almost uh, to a point of trying to create a consensus. And of course, creating a consensus sometimes becomes difficult, but consulting with the people and getting their views and so on and so forth is important because even, and, and is helpful because at some point you make a decision, but you make a decision knowing that you've catered for all of these different views and therefore later on when you have formulated something and you take it back to them for discussion, they will definitely support that. that. That's how it has worked. You, you start it from the beginning, not that you create a process and then later on you go selling it to people to own it. Thank you. Lady at the, yeah, that way. Hello, my name is Omnia, Global Shaper from Tripoli, Libya. Um, you've said that uh, with the years, you learn more and uh, some things you've, you might have done differently. So if the time goes back, what's the one thing that you might have done differently? You could have done differently. Thank you. I, I don't want to rewind the time to just say, uh, brings so many problems back. So I would rather want to forget them and keep looking ahead. I, I've already learned lessons from uh, what has happened. I don't want to go back to that. It, take, it will take a lot of my time that is valuable for creating the, the future. Someone had a question here, the second row. Mr. President, James Mwangi from, uh, from Kenya. I'm a young global leader living in South Africa. Um, Rwanda has accomplished a lot in terms of rebuilding and not going beyond rebuilding and building new things and we, we all have observed that and been impressed by it. You've been a big champion of regional integration and of engaging with the rest of Africa. The story of Africa is entering a new chapter, a less perhaps optimistic chapter than the one we've just concluded around Africa Rising. We're being ch challenged a bit. And perhaps nowhere more clearly than in some of the kinds of trends we're seeing even in our local neighborhood. And so if you look across the border to a country like Burundi, how do you think the lessons of history create an obligation for us as Africans? You've been a champion of Africans solving African problems. What is it that we should be doing in countries around us that are beginning to perhaps wobble on some dimensions that we thought we were hopefully beginning to put behind us? Thank you. Yeah, you see, in Africa, we have uh, a number of problems, uh, but some similar to the problems of the rest of the world, others quite unique, but let's talk about uh, ourselves. One is a problem of learning lessons and then trying to correct something because you've learned lessons. So we see problems repeating themselves decade after decade, and we keep moving on business as usual. Nothing happens. The second is 
implementation. Making work what you've learned lessons about and what you actually want to do. Being able to do it has become a problem. We're always in rooms like this and we are talking about problems in a very articulate way. Then we even articulate the solutions. So repeatedly, one year to another. But we don't come to say, what did we agree last time to do? Have we done it? How far have we gone into it? And if we haven't, why? So that you move to another stage, having dealt with that and you don't have to repeat it. But that's a big problem for us. And so the, the problem of Burundi or whichever other problem we may talk about, East Africa, and, and I don't know why people should remain pessimistic about Africa. I don't think the past for us has been good, the future is going to be terrible. I don't think so. Uh, uh, I'm still very optimistic. I, I still believe in, in Africa, in what we can do, and because we get more people, we get young people growing into positions of leadership or different positions, learning more, and, but then this is the problem. What do we actually learn? <laughs> if we are learning and we are growing into these difficulties, what are we bringing to bear on these problems to find solutions is, is the question. So Burundi, it's not just Burundi, we have many other cases, not very far from here. And this is the same situation. We have had problems. We should have learned lessons. And we don't apply those lessons to finding solutions to those problems. And uh, in the end, we have integration in the East African region. Some things working, working very well. Others not working. Or others we've talked about. We have not even attempted to one simple thing to even agree that this is East Africa, you know, what does integration mean? It means uh, you are trying to create really one space, <laughs> you know, that uh, works uh, seamlessly uh, and it's uh, for everything. But then at the same time, you, you've made commitments, you've said everything that needs to be said. And then when, to say, when we come to say, you know, people should move freely from Rwanda to some place or from place to Rwanda, and then I said, no, 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 wait a minute. It's like we don't need the people coming here. <laughs> <laughs> At the same time, we are talking about integration. We are talking about the benefits. You know them very well. But then when people are going to move across the border, you say, uh, yeah, quite an comfort. So I don't know. For me, on one hand, it's very simple mm -hmm. to understand and to do. I don't understand the difficulty of not allowing it to happen. I, I can't e easily explain that. Yes, I can explain it in one instance and find uh, the reason, but I can't keep finding good reasons in every instance. You know, coming from here to West Africa or, or from uh, West Africa to East Africa is, is such a nightmare. N not only in th that there are no airline connections, but even being allowed to, <laughs> I mean, this is not serious, but, but, but that's how it is, so. <laughs> um, uh, the lady there, and then I'll have to come back to the side of the room. Sorry, <coughs> it's a tough job. My name is Giselle Tamben, social entrepreneur from Cameroon. We go around the world very proud of what you have been able to do by bringing on board women and men, uh, reaching the parity. Is there anything uh, which you have experienced in terms of kind of leadership differences between men and women? Because today when we see what is happening, what happened to Joyce Banda in, uh, in Malawi, to Dilma Rousseff, to Michelle Bachelet, do you think they are not ready yet to be there? And stay there. Thank you. Thank you for that great question. I, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think uh, 
the, the, we, are, we, are, we are the same society. The women we are talking about are our sisters, mothers, aunties, or what have you. We, we are in the same house, in the same room, the same uh, human beings. Uh, in fact, the problem was maybe created by ourselves. Or, say, for example, not allowing women their rights and the opportunity to develop uh, and, and be themselves and be part of the society as they should be the way it should happen. This is the biggest problem. It's not that, uh, you know, yesterday we had a conversation in another session and, uh, you know, somebody kept talking about if you don't do this for women, we are talking about uh, growth and in Africa and inclusion and so on. And I was telling people, I said, you see, Africa have two problems. We think women have been left behind, which is true. In some places, you know, there are not as many who had the opportunity to do different things as men had for various reasons. But women have been left behind in Africa as men have been left behind in comparison with the rest of the world. So that's what puts Africa behind everybody else. <laughs> you see what I mean? So if, we, if we, we, we need to be solving two problems at the same time. One is Africa, we don't want to be left behind given the rest of the world. But at the same time as you are dealing with that, you, you have to make sure you are also moving together. Meaning in Africa, men and women been, have to be moving together, this is when we realize the maximum benefit for ourselves. Mm -hmm. But as to leaders of, I mean, differences in leadership or other capacities, I think it is hard to draw a line and say, you know, women are going to be better leaders here and better leaders. They all end up, as you are saying, I'm seeing a, 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 poor woman being uh, impeached in uh, Brazil, accused of all kinds of things, uh, as they would be accusing the same men who are actually accusing her. And uh, so as you, the, the other example you gave, whether it is Banda in Malawi, I, 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 I mean, we all can read what the situation is. I wouldn't say she was able to change Malawi in such a short time, she was there better than uh, men who were there. There are things that are common to all of us that uh, later on what we do and do better than others may depend on, uh, it doesn't depend on whether we are women or men, we, we are just maybe in this, in this regard more capable or better people than others, but not drawing this line. I, I, I don't think I would find a clear line saying women are better leaders, uh, except in one instance which I have tried to think about. Mm. I find, but we, women mm -hmm. have uh, less rough edges uh, in their way of dealing with the uh, issues than the men. Sometimes the men want just uh, to do it the men way and uh, and it doesn't really always work. I was waiting for that. Thank uh, you very okay. much. <laughs> I have a question here, and then I'm going to go to the back. Good morning, Your Excellency. Um, my name is Farai Gundan, and I'm a young global leader from Zimbabwe. I'm based in the United States. And before I get into my question, I want to say that you're one of my favorite people on Twitter. I appreciate your courage. Thank you. Um, Oftentimes, living in the United States, we hear a lot of, uh, from our Western uh, leaders on uh, their views on um, politics and elections in Africa. Um, and sometimes they're very unabashed with uh, what they think. 
I'm curious to know from you, what are your views, what are your uh, perspectives on um, the elections in the United States, um, the political landscape in the United States? And then I'm wondering, are you able to predict what may happen on November 4th or November, or November 5th? And who you might think would be the one that would uh, lead in the United States? I will answer some questions and not others. <laughs> I have to be careful here. <laughs> but for sure, I, I, I just freely say that, uh, you see, what, is, what I observe from a distance happening in the United States vindicates some of our thinking that, uh, and, 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 and in fact, it answers the other first question you said. Yeah. I think there isn't one way of doing things, as people may want us to believe, <laughs> yes. And, and what you said, when people are there bashing others and telling them to do this and do this, and then you point to some of these things that are happening to them, then you are really saying, after all, what are you really telling me to do? That you aren't able to get right in your own backyard. And it's interesting because when I see what is happening in the United States currently, and from the beginning, everybody telling you, you know, this man Trump, you know, this one, you know, just wait for one week, he'll be gone. And then he's there another week. Then he said, no, 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 but, but you <laughs> see, it, it is because of this and that. You know, he is going the next day. And then, and then the fellow keeps knocking out one after another of those people who are challenging him. Well, that's why I'm reluctant to, to talk about what happens <laughs> finally. <on the laughs> because, because it has defied all kinds of uh, predictions. You know, the pundits, who, you know, the analysts, the critics, everybody has been saying this and that now. If you put all of them in one room, they'll tell you, you know what? We didn't know we were so ignorant <laughs> about our own situation. But one clear thing also that comes out for me, it tells you that in a society like that, that more or less wants to pretend or tells people everything is fine and they can therefore dish out lessons for everybody else in the world, I see a disconnect between <clears throat> what leaders up there are thinking, the political elites, and what the ordinary people, the masses, are thinking about. This is, this is really, if you look at what has been happening, and as some people have already said this, it's an expression of anger, of frustration, of people saying, you know, for too long we are being ruled and led by people who do their own thing and who don't think about us. They don't address our problems. And they are really angry and then say, you know, they mean, as they say, the establishment, right? They are angry, of course, you know, it's very interesting when you follow closely. I've been following on the news and so they keep saying, uh, uh, Trump uh, followers or people who vote uh, for him are Trump diehards, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know in, in America they are called uh, diehards, in Africa they are called the psycho fans. <laughs> <laughs> you see, it's like, so they, they find another name, it's, they are high diehards, but they have the basis and so on and so forth. In Africa, if we were to do that, you become a second fault. It's like you don't really have good reasons for yes, that. Yes. So I think we should learn lessons ourselves. We always want to learn lessons. But I think these societies, developed societies that seem to have uh, all kinds of lessons for us, I think you need to learn lessons too. So for November, what happens? Let's wait and see. <laughs> there was a Christian lady at the very back of the room. And then I'll come to the gentleman in the middle here. Hello, my name is Rosebel Kagumere. I am from Uganda. 
Uh, I have a question regarding the Great Lakes region and uh, the political instability that we are witnessing. Right now, Uganda has, uh, is hosting a record number of refugees. We have never hosted that number of refugees in our history uh, as it is right now. Of course, uh, influenced by issues, uh, what is happening in Burundi and South Sudan. Uh, my question is, what do you see as uh, key challenges to electoral democracy in the East African region? Because it's not, uh, we have seen also political issues coming up in Uganda. Um, so nowhere is really very, very stable and people are um, a bit uh, un uncertain where we are headed. What, what could we do better uh, in handling transitions? Thank you. Uh, well, I think in Uganda you, you had uh, almost uh, the same uh, number of refugees in my time when I was a refugee. I grew up in Uganda as a refugee myself. I was there for close to 30 years. Uh, but back to your point, uh, electoral democracy and what else you said, I think is not the main, or, or at least not the only problem <laughs> Africa faces. There are many, many problems and it's many of them intertwine. It's, it's about governance generally, it's about uh, this poverty we talk about, you know, when the people are poor and they are barely surviving, it becomes easy, you know, for some people to manipulate them and use them for their own ends and so on and so forth. So, you know, and, and yesterday I was learning uh, on another panel yesterday, there's somebody who, who, who made a, a very interesting uh, comment and said, maybe what we need to look at in Africa is Africanization of democracy rather than democratization of Africa. I, I, I thought this was, um, because sometimes we just rush, even when there are real problems that we are talking about, but we have been made to look at them or think about them or try to approach them in, in such a routine way that hasn't allowed us to think beyond certain lines we have already created or that have been created for us. So it's, it's not about the electoral process is going to be as good as the people involved. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if you have had bad politics over a long time, if you are not used to accountability general and create it as, as, as a habit. Accountability in, in all, at all levels in, in different sectors mm -hmm. as a way of dealing with the situation. Then there comes a point in that electoral process and it's something explodes and you think it is just created there and then and it has happened. But it is actually an accumulation of so many problems that have been happening over the years and so many things that were never corrected. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we, we, people talk about corruption, they, but we always you know, just gross over that and, and move on. But corruption and politics and you know, when they have become a way of life, then you don't get surprised that you have problems here when it comes for elections and it's not about just elections. It's, it's an expression of so many problems that have been happening over the years and bad management of uh, mm -hmm. countries and societies. Yes, sure. yes. Thank you. Gentleman in the middle. Hi, Mr. President. I'm Eric Aku from Cote d'Ivoire, but I, I have to say I grew up in Rwanda. Um, I wanted to ask you, ask you is um, around uh, something that I see. So the Rwanda we celebrate, I believe, is the result of sacrifices people like you made. I think those sacrifices often come in the form of decisions you have to make, hard decisions. We are all here younger leaders. How do you make a decision in a context where, uh, as you were saying earlier, 
you are often forced or people expect you to do things that won't go within the context. So I'm basically thinking specifically, um, we are bound to face tough choices. I think this whole thing around what you described earlier around um, the change in the constitution and you having to think through, how do you really make those decisions as a leader in such a way that you stay true to your values and, and to yourself? Because I think this is one thing that we can all take away from this as leaders as we move forward so that we don't have to necessarily obey when people say something, but instead we can stand for what we think is right. Right. Actually, let me put it the other way. It, it is the other way around. This, I stay true to my values and myself and then make decisions. Not to make decisions and then become true to myself and this is the way. And Yes, precisely. That's why, for example, there were these discussions. I was really trying to, and, and in fact, I put it even to them. I said, look, even if from a personal perspective, I just think maybe it is time that something else happens. I was telling my people. And I said, we, I, I took them to the beginning. I said, for example, we, we, we discussed and they agreed we go, we do things like this. And now, after that, you are telling me we should do, be doing things differently from what we agreed. And you know, it was very interesting in the room. Some, I can see some people who are there in that room. But it was like, yes, we, we, we hear you. But there is nothing really cast in stone and say, it's, it's not, uh, you're not doing just mathematics and saying, you know, it's, it's, it's politics, it's management of a society, it's management of problems that even in most cases are beyond our control. Some things happen here, not because of us, or oh, because somebody has created a situation that will affect us in a certain way that we even did not anticipate, right? Mm -hmm. And so they say, okay, but we are the ones who indeed created this framework. Now, over time we've made assessment because we are coming to a certain point and we are saying, no, maybe the time we said or things we said we should be doing in this time haven't happened the way we anticipated, and therefore that means maybe more time. You see? So, but the debate was around this whole thing of saying, you know, but there are these principles, there are these values, there are these discussions we had, and now things are changing. And they say, yes, things will always change as long as we can explain that, then you should be also be able to understand. Mm -hmm. It's not because you said, no, one day I said this, and then that must happen. But that thing doesn't just depend on you having said it. It depends on many other things that happen between when you said it and when you, you are going to take another decision. So. Staying true to yourself and values is, is very important. In, in fact, in everybody's life, we, we need to have that. It, it becomes a bearing by which we move <laughs> and, and follow the compass. Otherwise, you get lost. Yes. But things will not always be as determined in advance because things will always change, either by your own accord or because of other factors that you don't even have control of. Final question from the lady in the middle here. So sorry, we'll have to close the session. <laughs> <laughs>